Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth, your series host. Democracy has always been complicated and messy, even in the best of times. Today, democracy faces stresses worldwide, populism, polarization, and post-truths that are stronger than ever before, amplified by new technologies and aggressive authoritarian regimes. Latin America and the Caribbean are not immune. At the same time, the concentration of power and the corrosive impact of corruption and criminal activities are undermining regional efforts to fight back. Institutions are weak, and the United States, long the strongest voice in regional democracy promotion, is losing influence to China, which is assiduously working to undermine democratic ideals worldwide. And this was before the advent of open AI and other tools that are already being employed in Latin America and the Caribbean to target democracy activists, opposition leaders, and to promote the interests of authoritarian leaders and dictatorial regimes. It's all a far cry from the heady days when the region emerged from dictatorships into the promise of democratic inclusive governance. Where is regional democracy headed? Can new technologies be harnessed for democracy promotion, including efforts to fight corruption? Is Latin America ready for AI? Our guest today is a global heavyweight, widely recognized for his analysis and prescriptions for the future of democratic governance. Moises Naim is a distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a best-selling author, internationally syndicated columnist, and television host known for influential books including The End of Power, Illicit, and his latest, The Revenge of Power. Moises Naim, welcome to Democracy Dialogues. Delighted to be here, Eric. A pleasure chatting with you. Did you ever think that in your home country of Venezuela, the people of the country would be receiving the news but from an AI-generated avatar? No, of course not. But I don't think this is a Venezuela story. This is a humanity story. Uh, this is a AI is going to affect everyone everywhere uh, at, at the same time. In the months since the release of your book, we've already seen some dramatic uh, increases in the use of technology, some advances there. What would you say uh, is the impact on the people who get and hold power? Who has access to power? It's a double-edged sword, this, all these technologies. First, let's establish the fact that this is not a, a new thing. Correct. Uh, this is different. Yep. The, we, all, we have been... Uh, seen how there are waves of technological change that we were told are unprecedented and change the world forever. And they fall short of their promises. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, artificial intelligence and all of uh, the ecosystem that it will generate is new. Uh, is new for everyone, uh, governments and, and companies and NGOs. Uh, everything is going to be transformed, touched, undermined, amplified, modernized etc. So um, all technologies are a double-edged sword, uh, uh, swords, uh, meaning that uh, they can be used for the good and for the bad. It can be used by governments uh, and by uh, activists for good reasons and for bad reasons for a long period of time or for immediate uh, concent highly concentrated power and energy on some aspect. So. We have to just, uh, is, I don't think it's possible to be ready for this because we don't know exactly what this means and what formats, forms, consequences it will have across different functionalities and countries and regions and so on. You say it's different this time. What makes you say that? Because I believe that this time it is a, a, happy, a, is a widespread global transformation. Mm -hmm that doesn't have anybody at the center of control, that uh, this is not a, a project of a, by somebody that is trying to achieve a specific uh, objective, but is the initiative of thousands of people and very soon millions of people. Already millions mm -hmm. of people are using it. Uh, and so we, we don't have technologies that have been ad adopted so quickly, so effectively, so deeply as uh, uh, artificial intelligence. But this is a dichotomy, no, because you've done some really compelling writing in the past about the concentration of power and power networks and who gets power, who wields it, who has access to it. 
But you're saying perhaps in this instance, this might make power more diffuse, or does it give authoritarians a new tool to accumulate additional power? Who knows? Yeah. It's who knows? Who is too, too early to tell? Uh, I will just tell you, Chu Enlai, uh, a former leader, of, a Chinese leader in the 70s, was asked about the consequences of the French Revolution. <laughs> and he thought for a bit and said, well, it's too late, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> and uh, so I think this is too soon to tell. Uh, all, all we can know for sure is that this is a deeply, deeply transformational uh, uh, technology for which we are not prepared and it will have all kinds of uh, unanticipated consequences. I want to pick up on that because clearly we don't know where this is leading. It is new. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean traditionally have been later adopters in the di digital space in many ways uh, and uh, haven't necessarily had the capacity to regulate uh, effectively the use of technologies, although that's changing. Uh, would you see this uh, need for human capacity and technological regulation in the region as something that people would need to focus on, or is this something that we don't really need to worry about because global institutions might take care of that? Well, global institutions always fall short of yeah. what is expected, needed, requested, promised. So <laughs> uh, uh, I'll be careful to put all my bets on, on global institutions. Uh, but at the same time, there is no doubt that uh, uh, the barriers to entry have been lowered thanks to this technology. Now we have individuals um, in, in their at home or uh, at a university or somewhere creating uh, tools and, 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 and consequences that are completely un unanticipated. Are Latin America and the Caribbean with human resources and technological capacity able to effectively regulate uh, these technologies? No, of course not. Uh, but it's, I don't think the developed world is uh, ready also. Mm -hmm. I think there is an issue with regulation. Mm -hmm. We don't have a very successful track uh, in, in, in con trying to contain uh, technologies that exist or scientific uh, knowledge that exists. Uh, th there are very few examples in history where uh, a new technology was discovered, was considered to be too threatening and, and, and hidden. Mm. Uh, or contained. Uh, so the, any idea the, or any promise that the, there are ways and barriers and obstacles that one can put in the development of uh, artificial intelligence are overblown. At the same time, the, the region has seen some early adopters. We think of perhaps El Salvador with Bitcoin and some of the others in cryptocurrency. There are examples where the region is out in front of, of others. Well, I don't know that uh, the Bitcoin experience in El Salvador was successful. I think that was an embarrassment for everybody. It was uh, eventually discovered to be the theater, ju just uh, a theater that, that eventually only had consequences for uh, the Salvadorans. Uh, but it's part of uh, President Bukele's package and, and, mar and brand and ways of presenting himself as a young, modern, highly advanced, uh, also in technology, uh, kind of president. But there is no doubt that uh, countries and governments around the world are looking at this and there are, you know, commissions and, and, and the armies of, of the world are, of course, scratching their head and thinking, you know, what kind of uh, weapons, the systems they have to develop in order mm -hmm. to um, be able to, to, to react to any uh, attack based on intel artificial intelligence and all that. So everybody is, ex is just waiting to see how this w works. Uh, and it's moving at great speed, mm -hmm. which also makes uh, detecting in which forms it will act um, harder. Let's go right to the heart of the democratic process, which is to say elections. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we have a number of elections coming up. We've got Argentina, we've got Guatemala, we've got Mexico. Now we have Ecuador. Uh, we may have Venezuela in 2024. Uh, but with new technologies, we've already seen the application in some instances of efforts at technological manipulation. What needs to be happening now to help ensure that elections going forward in the region are free and fair and, and free from some of the manipulation that I think a lot of people already fear? 
Well, the meta story about the elections in, in Latin America and perhaps around the world is that elections have never been so popular there now yeah. and, and never so frequent as they are now. They're constant. As we speak, I'm sure there are elections somewhere for, for president, prime minister, uh, or dog catcher, or you know, some <laughs> basic uh, uh, local uh, uh, political uh, positions. So the, the story there, I think, is that yes, the elections are popular as long as the incumbent wins. <laughs> so governments will support election only to the extent in which uh, they have a, a safe uh, possibility uh, of winning. So it's very interesting how the number of uh, uh, unfair elections uh, exists at the same time that elections are very popular. And that is because uh, the world has not dealt effectively with one of the main issues and challenges, which is what to do with dictators. Mm -hmm. So we all want Putin out, we all want Maduro out, uh, or Ortegas out. But w what do you give them in exchange? Are you going to sit with them across the table and say, I want you to relinquish power and I'm going to send you to jail and I'm going to take all of the assets you have stolen? Uh, globally, we don't have an answer to that. Lukashenko, are you going to sit down with Lukashenko to negotiate the terms of, of his exit? No. So that difficulty of uh, uh, creating exit ramps for dictators uh, is one that uh, I think is a meta story about elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a market failure if you want to put it that way in terms of uh, the political. It's system. an institutional failure, institutional of course, failure. for sure. Yeah. Not markets, but institutions yeah. are failing in providing uh, exit ramps. Yeah, absolutely. But faced with that scenario, authoritarians who agree to run elections, we just saw one in Turkey. Uh, you know, how do uh, democracy activists, opposition candidates, the international community work to ensure that elections actually are free and fair, as opposed to just the, the, the result is known in advance? This is one of the problems we are facing yeah. um, in terms of uh, uh, globalization uh, not providing um, answers. Uh, to global needs. Mm. A global need is for the international community, the global community of democracies to act together mm. and, and, and create conditions where elections take place, they are fair and, and, and free, and the, incumbent, and, and the winner takes power and the incumbent loses uh, power and leaves. That cannot happen with the uh, opposition acting alone. It will always have uh, uh, the need of some concerted multilateral action and, and to ensure the fairness uh, of the elections. And we don't have that. It also fails from enforcement, no? I mean, uh, and it used to be, at least informally, that the United States would serve largely in that role. The U.S. is perhaps less willing to do so these days. Perhaps that's an argument uh, or, or could be discussed, but at least in terms of observing, uh, the U.S. seems to be less willing to play that role. In the absence of the United States, who else can pick that role up? Well, uh, again, the, the United States and Europe play yeah. important roles. Yeah. Uh, we will need them to, to do that, but they have domestic... The, the countries are not very good at acting internationally, when mm. in, when nationally, domestically. Uh, they are uh, in chaos and problems, you know. Uh, they, they, political discord in the United States weakens the ability of the United States to work effectively uh, overseas. Yeah. We're here with author and noted commentator Moises Naim for a discussion on technology and artificial intelligence and the state of democracy in the Western Hemisphere. Moises, you have an entrant into the Western Hemisphere over the last 20 years that really didn't exist uh, in the last century and has changed uh, the scenario considerably. That's obviously China. Uh, China has access to some tools and technological ambitions, perhaps in the region, um, that uh, have taken a lot of people by surprise. Uh, how can we channel uh, this sort of relationship so that the benefits of globalization and investment and economic growth accrue to the people, but 
that some of the worst aspects such as intrusion or, or uh, popular monitoring or the use of technology against opposition is, is minimized. That will require a Chinese leadership to recognize that uh, they need to work together with the United States and that the long list of grievances that both sides have against each other be worked through. Uh, there is no doubt that there is going to be a competition between mm. the two superpowers. Uh, China and the United States will be at odds, will have uh, uh, problems, challenges, uh, misunderstandings, and that's inevitable. And both will do things that are going to be deeply irritating, uh, even offensive to the other side. But along the list of grievances and inadequacies in their relationship, you have another list, which is the reasons why they have to work together. Yeah. Uh, which is in their national interest that the United States and, and China develop a, a common view and a common set of actions that will help them. That is part of their national interest, as I said. Um, that is not happening. It may be beginning to mm. happen, but it's very important that both uh, the, Ch the Chinese government and the people in Washington understand that uh, working together will be inevitable and desirable. You would think that in emerging markets globally, but certainly in Latin America and the Caribbean, that there would be a confluence of interests in terms of trying to root out corruption so that uh, business activities could, could occur and we could, as they say, all get rich together. You've done a lot of work on corruption, but it seems like Chinese investment into the region sometimes amplifies corruption yeah. and reinforces it. Corruption is not the best way to enter into a negotiation. You yeah. know, the notion that you and I are going to sit down and denounce corruption and create laws and institutions. People will be watching and not believing that because yeah. the, in recent years, we have had several initiatives against corruption, notably in China mm. uh, and notably in Saudi Arabia. Mm. The, all, all the fast, the, 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 all the richest, wealthiest people in Saudi Arabia were taking to a hotel uh, uh, and would not be, that was a golden prison and until they gave back or gave all parts of their fortune to the government. Uh, in China, the anti-corruption uh, uh, initiative of President Xi was essentially targeted as uh, political opponents. So I, I don't know that corruption is a place to start, and I don't know that corruption has to be defined in the search for uh, the honest people that will be in government. Don't bet on that. Bet in institutions, build institutions, make sure the institutions work, and that you don't have to rely on your good luck of having uh, very honest men or women willing to s sacrifice their lives for in, in the name of, of corruption. Uh, let's, let's have institutions that know how to do that. Well, and we see what Maduro is doing right now in Venezuela in the name of corruption, uh, consolidating his, his uh, rule. Absolutely, yeah. and, and we saw it, uh, uh, of course, in, in what, in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let me ask you this question from the other side of the ledger then. The United States came into, uh, the Biden administration came into office where corruption was very much its top priority in the Western Hemisphere. Is that something that uh, you think has had a positive impact or, or needs to be rethought? Well, we haven't seen uh, the consequences of the initiative on mm. corruption. We have seen the consequences of his commitment to democracy. And, and in there, there are, we have had summits and meetings and a lot of talk about how to reinforce democracy in the region. Um, that, of course, will not be welcomed necessarily by Russia, China, Iran, uh, Turkey and, and, and Belarus and the like. Mm -hmm. Well, and indeed, I mean, in terms of trying to create jobs and build up the private sector for private sector-led growth, you need the private sector and uh, corruption can cut both ways in that circumstance. Right. Right. Yeah. I have seen in my research a, a, a growing presence of governments that are, are organized crime themselves. Mm. That are, they're no longer a traditional corruption which you have uh, people are essentially crooks outside the government uh, uh, and uh, either uh, forcing or persuading, cajoling somebody inside the government to make a decisions that will make a lot of money for, for the people involved. Uh, now uh, the situation has gone beyond that and what we are seeing is criminalized states emerging around the world in which uh, organized crime is the government. It's not that the, there's 
powerful people outside influencing mm -hmm. the government. No, now the government is organized crime and uses the techniques, the tactics, uh, strategies, tricks of organized crime mm -hmm. and, and uses to govern in many countries. I want to pursue that a little bit because I think that's a really important point and it's a shift, no, in terms of what we used to see. What's the nature of that? How do you, how do you it's, uh, so, you know, determine a regime that's fallen into that trap as opposed to others. We had uh, originally traditional corruption, yeah. uh, which is, you know, that, like a minister that steals uh, $10 million from a highway kind of thing, or the, you know, all kinds of transactional corruption. Then we had uh, the corruption of the head of state and, uh, and the, the, the groups around the government that essentially mm. stole the, the money. The friends and family. The <laughs> friends and family and the military <laughs> always. Military, sure. Um, and now we have uh, this, we have uh, organized crime in charge. Mm. And we see that in the Balkans. I think uh, Russia is a good example of that. I think Belarus is also, um, Nicaragua, of course. In that circumstance, is the national leader the leader of the crime syndicate or a tool of the crime syndicate? That's the change. Is yeah. the leader is is not, not just the, uh -huh. the, the the head of state, but is the whole system mm -hmm. that of organized crime that has taken over the state. And by by its very nature, then that corrupts all of the institutions uh, of the state. Except rule of law. except those that, uh, that take money that, that was originally stolen mm -hmm. in on the name of the. Uh, of the elite, of the oligarchs and the cronies. So then the question is to try to uh, bring into the conversation some of the things we were discussing earlier. Is the new technology helping to enable this or is that a separate storyline and there's really no connection between the two? It will change everything, yeah. uh, then this new technology and artificial intelligence and its implications for fintech, financial yeah. technology. Uh, are going, uh, we're going to see all kinds of new technologies, both uh, uh, to create innovation in financial sector, but also to m take advantage of it for criminal, for money laundering and, and criminal use of, uh, of funds and uh, financial institutions. Mm. So then we get to the, the crux of the matter. What can we collectively, democracy advocates, NGOs, civil society, democracy activists, opposition leaders, all of us together uh, somehow. What can we be doing now to make sure that these things benefit freedom and democracy and not reinforce authoritarianism or the corruption that uh, you've spoke so eloquently about? Light, information, education, legislation, uh, all kinds of things that, they, that, that try to compensate uh, the vacuum that existed in the past decade or so in which uh, uh, these autocrats took power uh, and nobody said anything mm. or people said very little and with no consequences. In the past decade, we have seen an explosion of, the, mm. of autocrats, o o often operating stealthily as if they were uh, Democrats, but um, they are in fact autocrats uh, that are dressing up as, <laughs> as uh, uh, you know, the, the leaders that the country wants. Are you uh, fearful, perhaps, that some of the countries are exchanging, quote unquote, best practices in authoritarianism? And absolutely. A, a dictator's playbook? Absolutely. Cuba has been doing it for mm. Venezuela for a while, yep. not in the, necessarily in the economic area where they, Cuba is essentially uh, uh, stealing and looting Venezuela, mm -hmm. but in the transfer of uh, security, yes. the torture, uh, methods of repression uh, that the Cuban have honed over this is 60 something years, they know how to control uh, a society by using very uh, refined techniques uh, of repression. Mm. As we begin to bring our conversation to a close, Moises, what's the optimistic scenario here? We've talked a lot about the risks and the downside, but what's the optimistic scenario, particularly for a region like Latin America and the Caribbean, where democracy in many ways is young, it's uh, not fully formed yet? We need better, better performing governments. Right. One of the underlying this conversation is governments that do not perform as expected, as necessary, as indispensable. So the improving, boosting the capacity of governments to deliver what people want is, is necessary. Autocrats are not better at doing mm. this. Actually, they're quite bad. Um, so uh, the, the hope here is that um, government uh, um, failure 
uh, may be met by an opposition and an international community that uh, moves towards uh, the country, towards democracy. But mm -hmm. it's not going to be homogeneous, or, or not going to happen in the whole region, and it's not going to happen at the same time. And frankly, perhaps utilizing some of these new tools uh, to support democratic governance and to root out some of the corruption by, by identifying where it is through data, et cetera. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, but they will also be very busy containing the attacks yes. <laughs> of, of these uh, new technologies against yeah. them and uh, against democracy. Well, the point that you made early on, I think, is absolutely right. This isn't a Latin America, Caribbean, Western Hemisphere story. This is a global story, and uh, we certainly will be following these issues uh, much more in the days and months ahead. Moises Naim, I really want to thank you for joining us here at Democracy Dialogues. This has been a fascinating conversation. I wish we had much more time to participate. Delighted to be with you Hope here. you can come back at some point. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you as well for joining us at Democracy Dialogues. Each month, we bring you the most pressing issues on democracy in the Americas with the top analysts, advocates, and advisors. Together, we can work to ensure that democracy delivers for all. Until next month, for Democracy Dialogues, this is Eric Farnsworth. Have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.